Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to answer a splendid question that one of you asked. This has been so much fun thinking about and coming up with the best way to approach it. And I hope I've done that. I really do, because I, I totally respect the question. The question is, what is chromatic sludge in music? Oh my goodness, what a terrific thing to ask. And it's for, as the the writer indicated, for beginners or people who not be may not be familiar with the terminology. First of all, chromatic sludge, I am proud to say, is a term that I might as well have invented. I mean, other people have said similar things, of course, but you know, it's 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 part of the the discourse of music criticism and whether it came from me or somebody else. I mean, maybe I use it more frequently. I don't know. But you've picked up on it, and you certainly deserve an answer. And the answer has two parts. The first part is, what is chromatic? And the second part is, what is sludge? So let's let's answer the first part with some musical examples. Well, we can do both with musical examples. So let's talk about the chromatic part. Chromaticism in music is a very sophisticated sounding term, which means something very simple. As you get from the Latin root, chromatic, chroma, chrome, it means colored. And the color in music comes from, obviously, the notes that you choose. And to make something chromatic, you need to choose notes that are outside the basic or fundamental key or scale that defines that key that the music is in. In later styles, atonal styles, for example, which are completely chromatic and there is no key, the term has no meaning at all. I mean, total chromaticism equals atonality, equals 12 tone. It, 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 for our purposes, it's all the same, so it doesn't make any difference. But in earlier styles, composers used chromaticism to make the music more affecting. How does it become more affecting? Well, when you use notes that are outside of the normal scale, or you use harmonies that are not part of the, the chords, the harmonic progressions defined by the notes in that scale, the music becomes more unstable. And when it becomes unstable, the perception of instability makes it, well, it gives a certain feeling. That feeling can be many different things depending on you know the style, the tempo, the accentuation, the shape of the melody. But chromaticism occurs essentially in two places, in melodies and in harmonies. I mean, both. And I have a fabulous, extraordinary example of this that I hope will allow you to hear it just immediately. It's the opening of Mozart's string quintet in G minor um, which is just an extraordinary work, where the chromaticism is pervasive, both melodically and at the end of this sample that we're going to play, harmonically. And I'm going to indicate exactly where it occurs so that you can see, you'll see a little, I'll make a little chromaticism pop up where the chromaticism happens. And so you could tell, first you hear it in the melody, and then at the end, you'll hear it in the harmony. So let's just get right to it. I want you to listen to this example, and then we'll talk about the effect that chromaticism has on the music itself. So you're ready? Here it is. Isn't that just beautiful? Oh my goodness. Now the first place we encounter chromaticism, and Mozart was a master of the use of chromaticism for expressive effect, is, is right in the melody, right at the beginning. It goes do 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 ya da da dum bum bum. Well that's chromatic. Ya da da dum bum bum. It goes in little tiny steps. I mean that's little tiny a chromatic scale by the way is a scale that goes by half steps 
That is, if you go on the piano, every key in order, including the black keys, you get 12 notes in an octave. That's a chromatic scale because it includes every note. It's chromatic. A regular scale in a key only has eight notes. So if you include the, the foreign ones, it becomes chromatic. Get it? So anyway, that phrase, do 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 ya da 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 bum bum is chromatic. And what does it do? Well, it gives the music a despairing, a whiny quality almost. You know, when you whine, you're going You whine chromatically. We complain chromatically. We mourn chromatically. It's generally associated with unhappy feelings. Normally, not necessarily always. You can it can be funny, it can be, you know, giddy, but usually, and in this case, particularly in the minor key, in the key of G minor, that bit of chromaticism gives the melody a whole different expressive character, a sadness about it. Oh my goodness, it's very, very beautiful and affecting, and you never forget it once you get it into your head. Now at the end of that example, we have chromatic harmony. And I indicated where it was. And you could tell from that little bit, well, it, it upsets the apple cart completely. It makes the music sound rootless, queasy, almost seasick, without a foundation. Now, Mozart, because he's working in the classical period, in a period which has very strong tonal roots, um, he returns to the basic key. And that return to the basic key, that anchoring, of the tonality of the piece is very, very powerful, all the more powerful after this diversion, this digression into a passage of chromatic harmony. So that's that's chromaticism. And you can hear in that example, I'm going to play it for you again, just how splendidly, expressively affecting it can make a piece of music. Let's listen to it again. Absolutely lovely and expressively on point. I mean, that's the, the artistic use of chromaticism. Now, in later music, post-classical music, during the Romantic period, chromaticism became far more pervasive. It began to infect the, the usual sense of tonality that we have. And Romantic composers, of course, thought that made the music more expressive, which it did. But used to excess, it's like, it's like you know, an extra rich dessert or an extra rich entree. You know, I mean, you, you better be careful because it could be so rich that you get digestive upset and have to run to the bathroom. And the composers who really exploited post-classical chromaticism were Louis Spohr, who nobody cares about, and... Wagner. Now, Wagner did it in his opera Tristan und Isolde, the prelude to Tristan particularly. It's, it's suspended in tonality. But Wagner's use of chromaticism is very interesting. People consider it extremely revolutionary. And it was. And it was because he used it to an extent that had never been done before. But but the point with Wagner is that his actual use of chromaticism was very traditional. In, in Tristan and Isolde, chromaticism symbolizes the love potion. The love potion that Tristan you know, and Isolde drink when they think they're taking poison to kill themselves. But it, it poisons the music. It really does. And so the chromaticism is used to be in a negative sense, emotionally, expressively. It gives the music that queasy, rootless, poisoned, polluted quality. And when you think about pollution, you know, you may think of sludge. 
Now, a lot of composers after Wagner took this idea of chromaticism and, and, and blew it up out of all proportion. They created entire styles based on that kind of chromaticism. Richard Strauss did it. I mean, Karol Szymanowski did it. Lots of composers did it. And, and some of them were very good composers. And they used this new style very effectively. And some of them did not. And when you use that new style rather ineffectively, what you get is sludge. Which brings us to our second definition. What is sludge? Well, Wagner gives us an idea. Sludge is the remnant of any icky industrial process that creates a waste product that's slimy and disgusting and thick and gloopy and smelly and revolting and generally, you know, it's pollution. It's a goopy, yicky, you know, leftover sewage gives you sludge, right? So what is chromatic sludge in music? It's, it's polluted music. It's music that is thick and heavy, and it's thick and heavy because of the, the wanton use of chromatic melody and harmony, usually both. Now, in order to get sludge, I mean, you could have non-chromatic sludge in music. You have to have a composer of singular incompetence or a performance of singular incompetence of music that has the potential to become sludge-like. And music that is sludgy usually is sort of flaccid in rhythm and extra dense or thick in harmony or melody or texture. It has to be sludgy. I mean, sludgish, sludge-like. You can determine your own version of just how, how thick and gloopy it has to be to become sludge, but it's, you know, in, in the mind of the, the listener obviously, but I have a fabulous example of chromatic sludge purposefully used, artfully used, well done chromatic sludge, where there's a purpose to it. And it is this tone poem by Portuguese composer Luis de Freitas Branco. It's called Artificial Paradises. What a fabulous name. What is a tone poem about artificial paradises? Well, initially what you hear is gorgeousness lovely, fabulous, iridescent gorgeousness with consonant or what we call diatonic harmony. The opposite of chromatic is diatonic, in case you're wondering. Diatonic harmony, beautiful melodies. It's just, it's just, it's a paradise. It's beautiful. But the point of the music is to show us that this paradise is artificial, that it isn't real. So what happens? The piece basically has two halves. In the first half, you hear this just unbelievably gorgeous passage of melody and harmony and whatnot and orchestration. It's shimmery and it's amazing. And then in the second half, it all was that it's repeated, but it's repeated as chromatic sludge. It becomes ugly. He uglifies it with the harmony and the melody. And you hear exactly the same stuff but it has now become its, its polluted, disgusting, poisoned, oily, yucky self. So you hear the normal version and the chromatic sludge version, and I'm going to play them both for you so that you can hear the difference. And that should give you a sense of what chromatic sludge is. After that, you've got to basically take it on a case-by-case -case basis, and we can take it from there. So let us start with the diatonic paradisical, beautiful version of the melodic material. Here it is.
And now, here is the same music that has been sludgeified, turned into chromatic sludge. Hear the difference? I, of course you did. I mean, you know, it's obvious. So that's what chromatic sludge can be in a in an artfully used manner. But otherwise, it's obviously a pejorative term. The pieces that best exemplify the use of chromatic sludge for artful purposes include Schoenberg's Verklärte Nacht, Transfigured Night, Strauss's Metamorphosen, um, Schoenberg's Pelias et Melisande, which is sort of the acme of chromatic sludge, in my view, anyway. And you can decide for yourself just how, how sludge-like the music gets and whether it benefits artistically from the sludgeification of the composer's style. But I hope that this has answered your question and gives you a sense of what to listen for when I talk about chromatic sludge, either in the work or in the performance. And you can make your own list of chromatic sludge pieces, sludge sickles that you can enjoy at your leisure. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for the question and take care.